Here's a definite integral that's beyond single variable calculus. I have the definite integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus x squared dx equals square root of pi. Since pi appears, we we'll want to pay attention for where the circles show up. This is a pretty important definite integral. In probability theory, it shows up when we work with normal distributions. In quantum mechanics, it'll show up when we consider the harmonic oscillator. Okay, e to the minus x squared. I don't know how to get an antiderivative for that function in closed form. So to get an idea of why this is true, let's look at numerical methods. Now, if I take the square root of pi, I'll get 1.772454. Let's take a look at what happens when I try to compute the definite integral using a Riemann sum. Now, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take curve for our function, I'm gonna chop off the tails at x equals minus 10, x equals 10. We fill our curve up with rectangles, so the heights will be our function evaluated at the endpoints, and then the length of each base is gonna be delta x equals 0 0.001. Okay, it's three or four lines of code, put it into my computer, what comes out? I have 1.772454. So I'm convinced this definite integral is gonna be equal to square root of pi. Now, you'll note, okay, the tails have gotta be very small since we're getting a pretty good degree of accuracy with just this setup that I'm using here. Okay, how do I get this to be exactly square root of pi? Well, we're gonna have a trick. I'm going to consider the integral over the plane of the function e to minus x squared minus y squared. I want to write this integral in two different ways. First, I want to let i be equal to the integral that I'm trying to find. Then what can we do? Okay, first computation of the integral over the plane. We're going to take e to the minus x squared minus y squared, okay? We're gonna break that up into a product of two exponentials. So I have a sum in my exponent, so we can split the exponential up. Now, I collect the x terms, collect the y terms, and I write this as two definite integrals. Now, since they have infinite limits, this is just gonna be an informal proof. We'll formalize things a little bit later. Once I've done that, my first integral is gonna be i. Our second integral is also i. Once I separate, the y is just gonna be a dummy variable, so we get the same answer if I put an x in. Now, I have i times i, which gives me i squared. Let's take the integral over the plane again, except now we'll use polar coordinates. How do we change things? x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, r squared equals x squared plus y squared, dx dy equals r dr d theta. Then for the limits, we're still going over the entire plane. So we'll have theta goes from zero to two pi, r goes from zero to plus infinity. We push all this stuff into the integral. e to the minus x squared minus y squared gives me e to the minus r squared. I'm gonna integrate first with respect to theta. r e to the minus r squared, I treat that as a constant, so I get theta put in two pi and zero, take the difference, I get two pi. Push it out in front. Now, if I wanted to take the antiderivative of e to the minus x squared, I'm out of luck. We can't get that in a closed form. But for r e to the minus r squared with respect to r, we can do the antiderivative by u substitution. So we'll let u be equal to minus r squared, du equals minus two r dr, or dr equals du over minus two r, put it into our integral. Now I want the antiderivative of e to the u with respect to u, that's just e to the u. Then I sub back in minus r squared. Okay, we're gonna put the limits in. So for infinity, that just says take the limit as r goes to infinity. I know what the graph of e to the minus r squared looks like. It just looks like that. And as I go off in infinity in either direction, it goes down to zero. For the limit zero, I put zero in, we have e to the zero equals one. So what do we have? I'm gonna have 
integral of our function over the plane in polar coordinates is equal to pi. For board one, we have that same integral is equal to i squared, so I have i equals square to pi. If you're worried about the negative solution, just note, we know what the graph looks like. It's always above the x-axis. Okay, that's because either anything's a positive number. So we have a genuine area, which means it has to have positive value. Now, that's our informal argument. How about a formal argument? So we're gonna do everything like we did before. The only change is we put our limit off to the very last step. Now, let's think about the geometry. So we have our function, e to the minus x squared minus y squared. Let's consider its graph in three space. So my integral over the entire plane, it's just gonna be taking the volume between the graph of our function and the xy plane. I wanna get rid of this infinite limit, so what we'll do instead is, instead of integrating over the whole plane, I'm gonna integrate over finite regions in the plane. I'm gonna consider three regions. I have this disk, it's gonna have radius of length r, about my disk is gonna be a square. Square is gonna have side length 2r. About that square, I'm gonna have another disk that's gonna have radius of length square root of 2r. Then we integrate our function over each of these regions. Okay, since we're looking at volumes, what we'll have is, since the regions are nested, the volume above d1 is gonna be less than or equal than the volume above our square, it's gonna be less than or equal than the volume of the big disk. We can compute each of these just by going through the steps in the informal argument. Okay, the volume above our small disk, it's gonna be pi times one minus e to the minus r squared. Volume of our big disk, pi times one minus e to the minus two r squared. And then for the integral over the square, I first define a sub r equal to integral over e to the minus x squared dx we take our limits from minus r to r. Then the volume over the square is a sub r quantity squared. Okay, now we apply the squeeze theorem. Okay, limit on the left-hand side. This term goes to zero as r goes to infinity, so we're gonna get a pi. On the right-hand side, same idea. This term goes to zero, I get a pi. That means the limit in the middle has to also go to pi. Since the square function is continuous, I'm going to push the limit to the inside of the square. That means the limit as r goes to infinity of a sub r is equal to square root of pi, but the limit of a sub r as r goes to infinity, that's just going to be our original integral i.